In 1975, my father, um, who was of South Korean descent, I have to say South Korean because when sometimes I say Korean, people are like, is he North Korean or South Korean? Can I make that clear? Um, of South Korean descent, my father had immigrated to this wonderful country, moved to Vancouver, and he always reminds me, back then, Big Macs used to be 25 cents, and I still think he's lying, but, but probably it was true. And he'd tell me about all this kind of stuff, and he'd tell, tell me about his, about his experience as being someone of Korean descent moving to a new country, and he was 20, I think he was 26 or 27. Um, that's when my wife and I got married, in fact. And he moved to this country with hopes to establish a new dream, a new hope, uh, new opportunities for myself and my son. So I was someone who was born and raised in this country. I was born in 1977, in fact, here. Uh, I look like I was born in 1987. I get it. But I was born in 1977. Uh, no? Is that some? Actually, now when I say that, people are like, stop doing that. Because you look old now, okay? Um, so actually, my wife said that to me in fact. She's like, no, it doesn't work anymore. A couple of years ago, it was like, no, you look young, but now you're, you look about 40, 40 which I am, 40 turn 41. Um, and, um, and so my parents had immigrated. Sorry, my father had immigrated, and he was working hard. And I remember he, he would tell me stories like how his first paycheck, he uh, would send that first paycheck back home to my grandmother. And I love that, the culture of just honor and respecting. And it was just really cool. So he had no money, but he would send, he came with $200. And he, and, and he would send his first paycheck back to his mom in Korea. Um, long story short, he, uh, I think he was dating my mother at that time. And they got engaged. And he moved to Canada first, and then eventually she moved to Canada. They got married here in Queen Elizabeth Park, which is really cool. Yeah, all right. oh, it was cute, all right? And they got married, and, we, and I remember one time falling up, um, upon these letters that my mother and dad were writing back and forth to each other, and it's all in Korean. I don't know what it was saying. That was, it's cute. Romantic, everything. And I remember finding that. I also remember finding um, a cassette tape. Do you guys know what cassette tapes are? It re- it's not an app or something, but <laughs> it's this really cool thing that you would put in this thing called a stereo. Do you guys know what a ghetto? Anyways, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and in the cassette tape was this um, song that my, my mom was singing to my dad. As she wrote a love song. I know, right? I know. And they're not like 65, 70. It's just, bleh, right? But, you know, it's just, <laughs> I'm just joking. It was really cute. And it was just, it was a really romantic thing. And I remember looking at that and, or finding that. I was like, this is so, so cute. And this is, she was in Korea and wrote him a, that song. And saying, I'm going to be with you soon, right? And so, really, really cool experience. So anyways, they moved. Um, I was born, they got married, then I was born in 77. And my brother was born in 79. Um, And all of their hopes and dreams for them to see me grow up in this country um, and experience opportunity and growth and education here, all that kind of stuff. Because Korea at that time, I think was a third world country, but now is extremely advanced, Right? But back then, third world country, um, not a very wealthy uh, um, country. Um, but they had these dreams for me that I would be, you know, a doctor or some lawyer or something like that. And in fact, my, my, the lie, it's a lie. My brother got the doctor prayer. I got the pastor prayer. So, you know, and they prayed, my father prayed faithfully for me every morning. Lord, I give my firstborn son to you that he would be a pastor, right? I, and then my brother got the doctor prayer, and I was always kind of like, why does he get the doctor prayer? And I got the pastor prayer. I love being a pastor, by the way. <laughs> I love you all. I love the opportunity that I've been given to pastor. Uh, but it'd be so cool if I was bi- bivocational. Doctor, pastor would be cool, too. Um, um, but I, I, I was thinking back to when my parents first came here, because we're quite young, and, and we have children of our own, and we have dreams and ambitions and hopes for our children. Um, But I was just kind of wondering what it must have been like for them coming to a foreign land where English is not their first language, it's not their heart language, this culture is not their heart culture. And so they're coming with a lot of this mentality of preserving their culture, coming to a new land, preserving their culture. And a lot of immigrants have that, where you're trying to preserve your culture. In fact, that's why a lot of ethnic churches have a preservation mentality, and sometimes it's hard for them to move beyond what they just so commonly have been trying to preserve, right? So I'm not saying it's bad or good, but I do think there needs to be, we have to move beyond our preservation mentality and adapt 
to what the new thing is that God is doing, right? And so I honor my parents and the Korean culture. And, um, but let, I'll, if I'm quite honest with you, I was the only Asian guy in my school. And then there was, well, well, okay, my brother's a guy too. So my brother too, me and my brother, were the only Asian, uh, with the, so only, I, don't know, I think only Asian guys, not just only Korean, only Asian guys in the school. We had, a, there was another Chinese girl in the school. She was born and raised in Canada. And I was supposed to marry her. Yeah, because we're Asian. And all my, you know, Western Canadian friends said, you guys have to get married. This is grade six and grade seven. And um, we didn't get married, um, you know, obviously, because my wife is sitting right before me. Uh, but we were confused because she's like, I'm Chinese and you're Korean, but I guess we're just Asian. Um, I would tell my friends, hey, I'm Korean. They're like, no, you're not. You're a liar. What's Korean? Because back then, literally, it was just Chinese and Japanese. And, you know, Japanese made Nintendo. So that's why we needed Japanese. And, uh, and so eventually, you know, now in Vancouver, Koreans are everywhere, right? But growing up, it, it was just me. And um, I remember stark. I share this with a purpose, okay? I remember starkly feeling at a certain age in my life that I didn't belong. But let me just say this. I, I felt like I didn't belong in various contexts. So when I would go to school, I looked differently. I looked different than my peers. Even though they were Danish or German or English, they were all what we would say white skin, right? Um, even though they were, they're different. They're not just all, it's like when we say, yeah, all Asians are the same, all white. It's not like that, but, but they looked different than me. And I, so I would feel a little out of place. And I remember then going to church, and then we went to a Korean church, and it was a church that I grew up in since I was four years old. And I would go to that church, and I would feel out of place as well, even though everyone looked like me, had the same hair color, and were Korean, I felt out of place. I had a collision of worlds uh, happening around me that I was dealing with. I always felt like I didn't belong in any circle. So here's an example. At school, my friends uh, would ask me, hey, if Korea and Canada went to war, which country would you pick? And at school, I would say Canada. Of course, Canada, right? And they're like, good answer, that kind of thing. Oh, yeah, 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 us too, right? Because we're proud to be Canadian. And then I'd go to my Korean church, and they would say, if Korea and Canada went to the World Cup, which country would you pick? And I would say, Canada would not make the World Cup. <laughs> so I would obviously pick Korea. But the reality was, it was, that was my response. In my Korean church setting, I would say, Tehan Minguk. I pick Korea, right? And then I go to school, I say, I pick Canada, right? And I, Canada, and, and I flip-flop back and forth, and I would, never felt, I would never feel like I completely belonged. Commonly today, that condition or perspective is what's called third culture. Have you guys heard of third culture before? Okay, it's not just a Christian term, it's a, psycholo- uh, it's a, it's a sociological term. And it, I think it originated out of this context where missionary kids were having kids in these other foreign countries and these kids never felt like they fully belonged. You see, that was kind of my identity crisis growing up. I had a, a, a crisis. In the Korean church, I felt like I wasn't understood. Um, I think they thought that I was really rebellious or that I just didn't want to learn Korean language and culture. And that's not true at all. At certain points, I did not want to learn the Korean language because I felt like it was being used against me um, or I was being laughed at because I couldn't speak a certain way or I didn't understand certain things. Or... And then if I go to school and, and work in all these places, I, I felt like because I looked different, I'd be made fun of because I didn't look like everyone else. So I had this common tension that I f- was struggling in. It was an identity crisis. And let me tell you how this messed me up. It caused me to react, overreact in certain ways. So when I was younger, I listened to, I started to listen to a lot of Korean music, pop music. I mean, Korean pop music is pretty, pretty cool now. There's a lot of great stuff out there. But back then, it was just on the brink of trying to become cool. So they copied everything that America had done, right? And I, tr- I started to listen to Korean music. I started to 
tried, I tried my best to watch Korean drama. Korean dramas now are different. Back then, everyone died by leukemia. Like, you're gonna marry your cousin, you found out, you found out, choose your cousin. Like, you know, like, th- the story's like that. Maybe it happens in the dramas today. But those were our dramas, and I, I couldn't engage my, I was like, this is so lame, I can't connect with it. But I tried, and I overreacted by doing all that, and trying, I it totally immersed myself in that. But prior to that, there was a rebellion against my Korean heritage. And the rebellion was, I, you know, whenever someone would speak Korean around me, I'd be like, oh, stop it. Because I felt like, by them speaking, I felt like they were judging me because I couldn't speak it. You know what I'm trying to say? So if they speak to me in Korean purposely, I have friends even to this day, peers and pastors even to this day, who intentionally talk to me in Korean, and I intentionally respond in English. And then they intentionally continue the conversation in Korean when I know their English is good, but I don't play that game. And for me, what I mean by that is, it's a subtle way of saying, look, you're Korean, speak Korean. You know what I'm trying to say? No? You guys are like, you should speak Korean, actually. But I feel a lot of judgment because we are predominantly Asian congregation here. Wow, I should not be sharing the story. Um, but that's kind of the context where I come from. I share this because there was a moment in my story where a professor from the States, from Princeton Seminary, came and he spoke at an event, and our worship team was leading worship at this event. This was 1996. Some of you guys weren't even born. Um, I get it, but I was born, and I was live, and this speaker said this amazing thing to me that really changed my life, and he said this. He was reading from... 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, and he said, you are not white, you are not yellow, you are orange. How many of you guys have heard me share this testimony before? This, is a, this testimony was so crucial for me. Because what he started to say was, he started to validate my third culture identity where I live in the tension of being Korean and being Canadian and allowing both of these beautiful cultures to actually shape who I am. So rather than finding shame in becoming too Canadian or having shame in becoming too Korean, I found that through this professor, he merged these two cultures together so beautifully that it gave me worth and it removed shame. Therefore, when I would speak at Korean church conferences and there's 600 children there and I'm speaking, they're all Korean, I wouldn't feel the pull to become more Korean, but just to be myself. Or if I went to Bible college in Abbotsford and to, to see an Asian there back then, it was to be, meaning you were a homestay international student. I'm like, I actually speak English well. But that's how, they, and then it was just not the norm, but because God started to say, you are orange and that's fine, completely something other, I was comfortable in being who I was even in that context. And so what started to happen was God allowed me to celebrate my uniqueness in my identity. Now, I am speaking to a people here. I don't care if you're Asian or non-Asian. I'm speaking to people here who understand this third culture dynamic. The generation and the time that we are living in right now, we are full of third culture people. Where you feel like you don't completely belong maybe with one particular group, but maybe you belong in many. And what I want to affirm with you today is this. There's a uniqueness about you that needs to be celebrated But that uniqueness is what God is going to use to advance the kingdom of God. Amen? So now, when I do speak at other ethnic churches, I speak at a Chinese church, Korean churches, Korean events, or whatever, I don't don't feel like I have to play this game where I have to be like a chameleon. I am just who I am. And the, some people will judge me for it, but after they get to know me, they start to go, actually, he's a real cool guy. I want to get to know who he is. Rather than judging me on my exterior and my dress and, oh, he, like when they say, you're, I didn't even know you're Korean. 
before I'd be offended by that. But now I'm just like, no, well, that's fine. I don't know what you think a Korean should look and talk and act like, but I'm Korean. But I was born and raised here, so that's just why I talk the way I do. Now, I bring this story up because I think, you know, one of my kind of MOs is identity. I think identity is crucial to people's lives. So your ethnicity, your social um, context, where these, all these things play into your identity. In fact, no one, like if you did not know anyone in this world and you were just kind of plopped on this land, and you would not know who you are. In fact, our identity is shaped by the people around us. That's just a scientific fact. It's a sociological fact. You are who you are because of the people around you because of your context and your surroundings. And there's nothing, and you don't have to be ashamed of that. It's not to shame you, but it's a true reality. Now, what I love about this is I want to uh, connect this to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And if you guys have your Bibles, your apps, your phones, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to start there. This story of mine plays closely into this hashtag that I bought into as my life mantra. When I was younger, I considered myself and I understood myself to be an ambassador for Christ. But you see, it, that biblical narrative comes from my own personal experience of my own identity struggle. Okay? And so that professor said to me, uh, said to us, <clears throat> who were second generation or 1.5 generation Korean or Asian, he said, you are not white or you are not yellow, you are orange, there's a uniqueness about you, there's something that sets you apart and we celebrate both, you are completely other and we are proud of that. And you are in this country for a reason and this is why, and then he referred back to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, in which it says, you are a, or Paul, uh, the, Peter says, you are a royal priesthood, a chosen generation, a holy nation. We are now citizens of his kingdom. Beyond a citizen just of a land or a nation or an ethnicity or a culture, now there's something else beyond that, and that is that we are all called to be citizens of heaven. Amen? And this is why it freed me up. And this is why I see color and I don't see color. I see color because I celebrate the diversity in your culture. But I don't see color in that I believe that the kingdom message of hope is for all nations. Amen? It's for all people. There's no barrier to it. Now, um, turn with me, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we'll, we'll read from there. Okay. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians, I should probably turn there too, chapter 5, says this, verse 11, <coughs> excuse me, verse 11 to uh, 21. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are plain, <clears throat> what we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again or are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died and he died for all. And those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin 
to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Wow, I love this. I love, love, love this section in the second letter to the church in Corinth. This second letter to the church in Corinth was written to a church that was in a growing and up and coming city. I perceive Vancouver to be a growing and up and coming city. Even though we're a world class city, we're, we just, I talked about this with my friends down in LA that we're going through the train together. We looked it up. Vancouver was number three, I think it was on Forbes or something like that, number thir- third place in the world to b- best places to live. It's always in the top five or 10 or something like that, right behind Hag. Hag is up there too, right? <laughs> so, no, ouch, wow. Hag? Hag, oh, Hag. Um, but, um, so Paul is writing to this city that's an up-and-coming city. It is a, a place where traders and travelers would come, where tourists would come to view uh, just eastern, the eastern Mediterranean. So it was a social and economic hub, and it's kind of like Vancouver. We're at the, the gate on the Pacific coast there to all the countries in the east, uh, eastern Asia. And so Paul is writing to this church that's in this up-and-coming city. And in this up-and-coming city, it's a city with new ideas. It was a city that was open to new ideas. And it's also like Vancouver. In fact, Vancouver, I've heard, and maybe my stats are quite old, but I've heard, word of mouth, that something like 4% of the people in Vancouver actually attend the church. Right? Four, it's pretty low, pretty, like 4%. And I look at that and say, okay, you can go, oh, that's so bad, shame on Vancouver, da, da, da. But I also say, but I see that this city, the people here are so open to new ideas and new spirituality, which then excites me to say, we can now then have new conversations about faith by removing the religious language and religiosity and just talking about Jesus. So it excites the heck out of me because people are hungry. They're searching. It's just that religion will never, ever, ever fulfill them. Amen? And I love that. I love that religion is not fulfilling people, but Jesus can. And so Paul is preaching to this context in this new and up-and-coming city, new ideas. People are open to new ideas, new concepts of spirituality. They're open. And Paul is a tent maker there. And what's cool is he's a tent maker. He literally made tents and tarps and awnings and maybe even sails for the ships that would come in. That was his trade, the way that he would make income so that he could advance the kingdom of God. It's so beautiful. And he chose that city to do it. Why? Because it was a missional, strategic purpose. It wasn't just an economic reason. So many of us are driven by our economic reasons to start businesses in certain places. But for him, it was to be at the city center wherever he can be a uh, wherever he can have the people come to him and he can influence them because he knows when they leave this city, they're going all over the world. How amazing and how strategic is that? And that was Paul's intent. And so he has this uh, awesome opportunity to now address the church in Corinth that that was having some major issues. In fact, some of their issues were, they start to question Paul's teaching. And they start to follow these other kinds of uh, leaders, religious leaders, that were teaching things that were contrary to Paul's teaching about Jesus and the cross and the resurrection, the church in Corinth was getting tired of trying to advocate for the cross and the resurrection. And they're saying, Paul, this is scandalous stuff, but we like what the other teachers are teaching. And Paul, therefore, has to write these letters to Corinth to defend himself but more than defend himself, defend the message of the gospel. But why does he do that? Why does Paul choose to defend the message of the gospel of the church of Corinth? For this very reason, like I said, because the church in Corinth was positioned in such a vital and crucial city that had the potential to influence the world. 
Because that was my question in my sermon. I said, why Corinth, Paul? <clears throat> and I researched it, and this is exactly why. Paul then, therefore, in this context and this framework, where the people in Corinth as new Christians are feeling like third culture people, they're out of place, and they want to belong in society. They don't want to be the misfits, the outliers. Paul then props them up by challenging them on how they believe and how now they should or ought to believe. And this is where 2 Corinthians chapter 5 comes into play, verse 11 and on. So Paul <coughs> then challenges his people, the church in Corinth. And he says this, in verse, I'm going to skip to verse 20, then I'm going to go back and reframe it. In verse 20, he says, um, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. Paul says to the people, the church in Corinth, that you are representatives of Christ. An ambassador was a representative. The modern understanding of an ambassador is a, is a, is a dignitary who's sent on, on behalf of the president to go to another country uh, and to build relationship. If there was a relationship that was severed or it was not healthy, the, the uh, ambassador would go and represent the country and the president and help mend relationship, economic, uh, economic relationship, political relationship, whatever, whatever it might be. Back then, though, for an ambassador, it was a little bit different. An ambassador would not only go to represent the president and the country, an ambassador, in fact, would walk into their foreign lands with gold around, gold, can you guys imagine gold chains? You guys think hip-hop artists got their, no, it started from old biblical ambassadors, man. They came with like chain and they're dangling it and, they're, and they had pendants all over their body and they're, they're walking with a little swagger, right? They're walking a little swag and they're representing their land and their king. The gold showed this new land that they're moving into that we're coming from a place of wealth and power and status. So they wanted to represent the strength of their land by wearing this. You know what's so amazing about this other ambassador that we see who is called Paul? He was an ambassador in chains, as it says in the, in the epistles, right? He called himself the ambassador in chains, but his chains weren't of gold and pendants. They were literally of prison chains. So you see a stark contrast there with the different kingdoms that are being represented. So an ambassador at the time would not only come with strength and power and dignity to represent the, their homeland, <clears throat> but they would also go, be sent to help mend relationships. But here's the unique thing. The, um, in Paul's time, it was a, a consistent battle was, do you choose Rome and the Caesars and whatever, or do you choose God and his kingdom? That was his common struggle. Because in the Roman culture, it was, choose Rome and Caesar and worship Caesar. And so Paul had to battle that duality that was happening there. But here's the, the way that the Roman government would work. They would send, they would actually just roll over and steamroll other lands and nations. And rather than sending an ambassador to go, an ambassador to go and represent the Roman emperor, they would send a governor. Why is this important to understand? They sent a governor to go and rule over that land. But you see, God sends an ambassador to go and make an appeal. The Roman God sends a governor just to steamroll and to rule. Then what would happen is as a Roman gover uh, governor would send a Roman, uh, Caesar would send a governor to go and rule the land that they just kind of conquered. That land would then send an ambassador back to the Roman Caesar God and say, we appeal to you. Forgive us. Let's build this relationship. We don't want you ruling our land. Okay, this is really important for us to understand because it kind of helps us understand what's happening here in the scriptures. But what we find with God, with Christ, is he doesn't send governors. He, he doesn't say, you are the governor of Jesus. He says, you are a, an ambassador of 
Christ. The Roman perspective was, you come to me, you send your ambassadors to me. God says, I send my ambassadors to you. In the Roman perspective, it was about you making your way back, appealing, and then maybe I'll forgive you. Maybe we can mend this relationship. From God's perspective and Christ's perspective and Paul's perspective, it was God has already done the good thing. My appeal to you is to receive it. So an ambassador is someone of, with, of highest rank and dignity, and is, God is calling us that. We are, therefore, Christ's ambassadors, is what Paul says. And as an ambassador, we're called to renew, revive, rekindle friendships and alliances and relationships. And this is part of our function. We are called to therefore go and make reconciliation, call people into reconciliation with God. Now, let's go back to verse 11. And we're going to go through each verse. <clears throat> this is going to be kind of fun, I think. And see how an ambassador of Christ represented the king in terms of uh, as a Christ ambassador, what it, what it could look like. In verse 11, um, it says, uh, since then we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is plain to your conscience. Since then, it says, we know what it is to fear the Lord. To be an ambassador of Christ, you need to understand in your own personal life that you fear the Lord that you worship God, that your life starts and ends with God. That's what fear of the Lord is. It's not to be afraid of him, but to honor and to revere him, that he is your number one and he is your everything. Amen? When I look at my wife and kids, I love my wife and kids, but if I'm not careful, if I'm not careful, I will start to put my wife, our marriage, and our family as my God over the one who gifted me my family, who is, God is my God, right? I cannot mix up the two. So the first point is this in verse 11. As an ambassador of Christ, you have to know what it is to fear the Lord. Because once you've encountered God yourself, once you've experienced Jesus yourself, then it says you can persuade others. I love what Rob Bell said. Someone asked Rob Bell, like, you know, what, what, what do you think is the problem with the church? Or, or, or he said something like, um, Rob, talk to me about communication. Or how do you preach? And he said, first point is this. To be the best communicator, you have to be, uh, you have to be smoking what you're selling. Everyone, oh, I get that. If I said it another way, you could be like, I don't get it. But you have to, we're in Vancouver, so kind of, we all get it, right? You have to smoke what, don't go and smoke. Well, you know, I'm just, my point is, you have to smoke what you're selling. And that's what Rob, and I think it's totally true. There are so many of us who do the Christian religious thing, but you do not believe what you're saying. You do not have the fear of the Lord. You yourself have not been persuaded. So when you talk to someone else, you just sound like a used car salesman. Why do you think so many Christians are obnoxious? Because we sound like a used car salesman. We're selling a product. It's not persuasive. I can smell you a mile away. I'm not here to buy religion off of you. Do you know what I'm trying to say? So we got to smoke what we're selling. Verse 12, and Paul says, we're not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. So verse 13, if we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. There has to be an element as, as a Christ ambassador where you truly understand who and what it is that you're representing. And it can't just be, I took this Bible study class and now I know. But your heart has to be one to that. That what it is, that, that is whatever it is that you're trying to represent. Um, some people tell me, PT, you uh, love shoes. I love shoes. I love shoes. But let me tell you something. 
I think I would be the best shoe salesman on this planet. And actually, when I did sell shoes, I was pretty, I was up there. Because I didn't care about the sales so much as much as I cared about the shoes. Get it? I just wanted people to share in the joy of having wonderful shoes on your feet that will make you float and feel wonderful and complete your outfit. I don't know. But you get what I'm trying to say? So it has to look like you're out of your mind in a good way because you've totally, you've bought into, not just bought into, you've experienced and encountered for yourself. Um, I was watching this video clip uh, of a man, uh, of a kid, a five-year-old boy named Duffy. He was on Oprah Winfrey, on the Oprah Winfrey show with all of his fundamentalist conservative family members. And at five years old, he's wearing a suit and tie, leather Bible in his hand, and he's screaming, you are going to hell! And he's known as a five-year-old preacher. And um, no joke, that's his message. You're going to hell. Repent, you're going to hell. I don't even think repentance was in there. He just said, you're going to hell. And, and it was brutal. This boy would get kicked out of school. <coughs> he would, uh, would not be allowed to come onto campus at five. It's because one day his dad came up to his bedroom and said, son, and he wakes up his son. He goes, if you die today, you're going to hell. And the son goes, I don't want to go to hell, dad. He goes, okay. Then I want you to pray this prayer with me, and you're going to become a preacher. I'm not even joking. This is his story. It was so absurd and outrageous. Uh, it caught Oprah's attention, and it's been on Oprah's show from a long time ago. And, and so what gripped me about the story was not that just this kid was being obnoxious, and this whole family was being obnoxious, and they drank the wrong kind of Kool-Aid, I think. But it was the fact that that boy was not effective. One, he was yelling that everyone's going to hell and screaming at everyone. But also, he did not know what he was selling. He didn't smoke what he was selling. And as an ambassador of Christ, you need to understand that your foolishness is for a reason. It's because he's worth being foolish for. Yeah? That message is contagious. That message is real. And in our time and in our generation these days, we need real. We need real. We don't need religious. We, need, we don't need salesperson. We don't need fake random acts of kindness. We need relationship. You represent him and his kingdom. You don't represent a religion. Stop fighting for Christianity. We're here to advance his kingdom. In verse 15, and it says, uh, 14, for uh, this is the attitude of a, an ambassador of Christ. For Christ's love compels us, church. For Christ's love compels us. Because we are convinced, listen to this, that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. One, the posture of our hearts as an ambassador of Christ is primarily that of love. So it doesn't matter if you're right. Are you loving? Do you understand what I'm saying? Can you imagine ambassadors who are commissioned and compelled by the love of Christ because they've experienced it themselves and they're sold out to that. They've encountered God. Now they're going out and their primary motive is not to win you over, but to love you. What can this city look like? Why is this so important? Paul says... For Christ, because we are convinced that what? One died for all. I don't know if we all believe that Christ has died for all. Let's go there. Let's go there. I think some of us, some of us believe that Christ has died for the good people. 
that Christ has died for the church. Christ has died for the Christians. But do we actually believe that Christ has died for all? I'm talking about the Muslim friend down the street. I'm talking about the prostitute who's on the corner on Edmonds and, and Kingsway. I'm talking about all these people that you would consider misfits, the drug dealer, the abuser, the molester, the murderer, the adulteress, the adulterer, these people. Christ died for all. And because of that truth, it's a love that compels us to go. And our point to them isn't to say, you better turn or else you're going to hell. Because then that's religious. Because that person can't make their way back to God. But our message, compelled by the love of Christ, because we have been impacted by it, we go and tell people, would you just receive it? Because Christ died for all. Would you just receive it? Church, that is called grace. That is called being an ambassador of Christ. Amen? This is why this tagline is so important for me. Everywhere I go, whether I'm playing sports, whether I'm out eating, whether I'm hanging out with my family, every person around me is not someone for me to win, but is someone for me to love. Because I know that God loves them. Whether they repent or not, God loves them. And he died for all. My message then when I interact with people is, dude, I love you. Would you come just to receive and open your heart to receive the love of God. That's it. That's it. I'm not asking you to do anything else at this point, but just to know that Jesus died for you, the whole world. You just have to receive it. But somehow we get it cloudy, the message, and we go, okay, God loves you, but you got to come to church. But you got to stop dressing that way. But you got to stop doing your drugs, but you got to stop doing, but, and I get that, the behavioral stuff, I get that, but that is not a prerequisite to coming to God, but we make it a prerequisite, and that's why so many of our churches are just filled with the older son in the prodigal son story, and the younger sons are still out there, because they don't feel like they're good enough. They don't believe that Jesus died for all. Jesus died for us is what they probably believe too. And my challenge for us is what kind of king do you represent? Who is it that you actually represent when you go out into this world? Because I think for some of us, we don't know. And it may not be the loving God that, um, that we are actually, you know, we, we have these weird, weird constructs of what God is, and we, me, uh, we misrepresent him to the world from uh, verse 16. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. I love this. Uh, Paul is honest. Hey, look, from now on, I don't. We don't regard no one with a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in that way. Ouch. Paul is being real. I used to judge people. Outwardly, I even judge Christ that way. But we do that no longer. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of of reconciliation. The only reason why, if you are a follower of Christ here, the only reason why you're reconciled to Christ is because of Christ. Okay, let's get this straight. Let's get this straight. Let's be honest. There's nothing that you did. There's nothing that you did to reconcile yourself to Christ. Nothing. It's all what Christ did. Amen, and that's the best news in the world. 
But when we mix that in religious waters, good news becomes average news. And sometimes for most, becomes bad news. Jesus says, forgiven much, loves much. Forgiven little, loves little. Isn't that true? And I think for so many of us who might, may have grown up in some religious context, we think that we've been, we actually don't even know how much we've been forgiven because you actually probably think you're really good. So for the message of the good news, it's not actually good news for you. It's actually quite offensive. Because how can someone who's not as good as me receive so much grace? That's not good news. That's bad news. But the good news of the gospel is that he died for. He died for all. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, verse 18, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Whatever hope that you've experienced, whatever joy, transformation, life, transition, redemption, um, love you've experienced is not just for your own personal ministry of self-glorification, self-worship, self-growth. We've been all invited thus far, thus far, thus we are, we've all been invited to be, carry out the ministry of reconciliation wherever we go. So I'll just say this. If you've experienced reconciliation, being reconciled to God, that will naturally permeate to others where others will say, I want that reconciliation too. And Paul says, we've all then been given that ministry of reconciliation <clears throat> where we are appealing to others. So verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. We, therefore, when we go as ministers and as ambassadors of Christ, we do not count the sins of people against them. Because if you're going to do that, then you better ask God to count our sins against us. But the message of grace and hope is God's love is unconditional, is bigger than any pain, shame, agony, sin that you carry. Amen? He chooses to forgive. And so <coughs> he says, not counting people's sin against them. This is grace. And he has committed to us the message of re reconciliation. Verse 20, we are therefore. And that's why the therefore is there. You see, when I used to preach this message before, the therefore was there because it was more of a guilting, a shaming way for you to go out and be missionaries. You know what I mean? Go and win souls. Because that's our job. But the therefore in the context of everything I've explained in this sermon, the therefore is there for you to understand that you first have been reconciled to God when you didn't deserve it. And therefore, we are to carry that ministry of reconciliation out to others. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God we're making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This screams good news. This screams gospel hope. This screams what the kingdom of God could look like and is supposed to look like. This kingdom is about our king and our king is compelled by love and grace and mercy. One, one of my hopes and desires for our church is that we would be a people that love so recklessly and dangerously that even the worst of the worst sinners feel absolutely, unconditionally loved. The scandal of the gospel is that. But it has to start with me. There are times when I feel more self-righteous than others, and that's where the religious spirit comes in. 
like I deserve God's grace even more. But we see in the end of chapter five is that it was because of God we become the righteousness of God, not because of me. If we ever find ourselves getting a little mixed up in this, I encourage you to come back to Jesus. Come back to the fear of the Lord and where you stand. Are you guys feeling me? Yeah, a little bit? Maybe. Who's feeling me here? Thanks for my thanks for addressing my insecurity. <laughs> In my, um, <clears throat> let's see, what else did I miss in my notes? I just wanted to go through each verse by verse by verse by verse. <clears throat> my wife says, my sermons are the best when I just do that. And so. So there is something beautiful <clears throat> about this. Why is this so beautiful? Let me just say this. Some of you um, would like our church and our leadership team to do more mission trips. Some of you would like us to organize a mission trip to Asia, Europe, Africa, somewhere, so that you can go and represent Christ. How about we do that here? How about you do that on your own, wherever you are? Why do you need our, our church to plan a trip for you to go do that? What I imagine to be much more effective is for you as a haven, a place of refuge and healing, of hope, of transformation, for you, wherever you go, to create that environment there. There's a reason why people who come out to our Monday basketball love coming out to our Monday basketball. I think me and Peter Shin are the only, and June, right? Is there anybody else? Are the only COA people out of the 16 plus people that come. Only people from our church who can play basketball? No, right? I hope not. <laughs> Jeez, I hope not. But who actually play basketball? <clears throat> but us being there, my mission is simply to love. And like the people, the guys there, they all love each other. They connect, they laugh together. They never feel like we're preaching at them, judging them. They don't feel, in fact, I don't even think they think I'm a pastor because the way I act, right? It's so diffusing. <laughs> all the swearing just really, no, I'm just joking. <clears throat> but what I hope that is that wherever I go, I can help foster an environment where they would experience love and in that experience the love of God and in that and through that, they wouldn't return to Christianity or to church, but rather they'd experience and encounter Jesus. Because when you start to love Jesus is when you start to love the body. You can't love the body first and then love Jesus. You know, it's really hard. Because it's, it's really hard to love the church body sometimes. But let's start with Jesus. And from that place, let everything else flow. When I talk with pastors, they're all like, PT, how do you do this? How do you do that? I'm like, point them to Jesus. I know we get it. But what program, what program, what program, what program can we use to get them. And my mind is like, you're the program. You are the program. And maybe it's because you have not encountered Jesus yourself. Let's start there. And it's okay if you haven't, but let's be real. Alpha course, good thing. We're probably gonna do alpha course in our church. But it's a program. That only works if you yourself, whoever is running it, has been won over by Jesus. And you understand that you represent Christ. And you understand that your presence there is an appeal to the masses. Come and be reconciled to God. Your very own presence. Not a gospel presentation, not a Bible tract, not a convincing argument of jabbing Huh? You throw that apologetic lob, I got a jab for you there, a counter. But rather, your very presence, because you're the temple of God, is an invitation for other people to come and enter into this collision where heaven and earth collide. But honestly, we just don't believe it. And I hope today, I know that we're not going to walk out going, I believe it, I'm an ambassador. I, I get that. But would you posture your perspective 
to understand that this is who Jesus is calling you to be and be it. But listen, be it the orange way. Get it? Be it the way that you can be it. Do you hear what I'm saying? That's why the orange way is so important for me. I use my multicultural tension to connect with every kind of ethnic cultural background. I do not care. I do not care. I really don't care. Because I'm using that story part of me to advance his kingdom and to be an ambassador. 